Um, today we're um, going into week two on a series in the, um, the Sermon on the Mount. This is the main body of Jesus' teaching. If we are, are taking seriously Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. You say, well, what did Jesus actually teach? This is kind of the main chunk that you get there in the setting. As just a little review from last week, is this, Jesus is kind of launching his ministry. And he's going about the outer region of Judea, Galilee, and he's teaching and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of heaven. As a, and as a sign of that kingdom, he's healing people of all kinds of diseases and infirmities, and, he, and he's teaching them. And naturally, this draws a big crowd from all over the place to come and see him. Thus, we end up with, with this, the Sermon on the Mount. And so last week, we began with um, the Beatitudes, the, the series of verses that start with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, and so on. And uh, what does that word mean? Again, it means like kind of happy, successful, favorable are you in God's kingdom. And it's those who hunger and thirst. You know, it's the, it's the poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek. They're going to inherit the earth, it says. They're going to be comforted. Theirs is the kingdom. And the fruit of receiving this kingdom, what changes in our hearts, a spiritual transformation, is we become merciful because we've been shown mercy. We be, we're pure in heart because we know God. We've seen God in Jesus. And we become peacemakers because God has made peace with us by his blood and we become children of God. And so there's, there's a, a way of seeing it. And Jesus' astonishing claim Okay? The thing that's so astonishing about this claim is that these people, this agrarian, lower-class group of Galilean, mostly farmers, fishermen, you know, tradespeople, whatever, these people who experience this transformation, exhibit these traits, are the salt and life. They're salt and light of the earth. All right, so let's read um, Matthew 5, 11 through 16. Matthew 5, 11 through 16. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? And is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town, or the word is city, really. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Would you pray with me? Father, here is a, a word for us. This is a time when, more than anything, our world needs salt and light. Uh, this world needs only what you can give. And God, we, we just pause now, and I just want to pray for our world, especially for our country right now, as we watch um, civility uh, decline, collapse. We see um, things that we've taken for granted for many years in upheaval. And more than anything, Lord, we need to know how it is that you call us to be salt and light wherever we're at in this time. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, this unlikely group of people, Jesus says, you are the salt and light of the earth. And before we dive into exploring even what those words might, might mean, we got to wrestle with the question, what good can the poor and the meek do? The merciful and the peacemakers. What can you accomplish when your goal is righteousness and your only weapon is a purity of heart? Don't these people usually get devoured and trampled on by the competition? Is it not the cutthroat and the ambitious and the assertive who have the real power for change in this world today? Isn't that the way it is? Should we not respond to this teaching with kind of a smirk and think to ourselves, you know, Jesus, 
this all sounds very nice on paper, but we who are enlightened in the 21st century know that it's, it's, this is not how the real world works. You know, shouldn't we say that? But Jesus understood that full well. Okay, he understood how the world works. Okay, and my sense is that even today, he would disagree with that assertion. And the truth is that in all of human history, no single group of people has had more impact on our world than at least some of those peasants who were hearing Jesus' words that day. Let that sink in for a second. Some of the people that were hearing these words, these unlikely people who were overlooked, not the blessed people, according to society's definition of who should be blessed, those people we said, you are salt and light. You're going to be, you're the meek. You're the ones who are spiritually depraved. And it's by your mercifulness, your hunger and thirst for righteousness, you as peacemakers, you're going to turn the world upside down. And they did. Like, because of what happened in Jesus and those who took this mission forward, who heard those words, there has been no greater impact on the human race in the history of our world. So I think Jesus was right. So clearly when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world, he must have something bigger in mind than you make the world a tastier place. <laughs> you, know, you make the world a better, a nicer place, right? I mean, that might be part of it. So what does it mean? What, what does he mean when you are salt? Like what's, um, what are, go ahead and shout it out. Like what are some uses for salt? Anything. I heard like three things at once. Sorry. It preserves things. Oh, somebody is like on to the, the thing right now. Yeah. It makes food taste good. Uh, you can melt the ice with it. It kills slugs. You know, <laughs> you are the slug killers of the earth. Go and make disciples, right? Um, yeah. I think that the big thing that Jesus is pointing to is that most often in this time, salt was used as a preservative. You know, it can be a disinfecting agent. It can be all kinds of things. But the, remember, these people didn't have refrigeration. They didn't have ways to keep food cold. This, they didn't have many ways of keeping food from going bad like we do today. And so this is the primary way you'd keep meat from going bad or rotting. Okay, you rub it in salt, and, and people still do that today. You've got like salami and prosciutto. You know, these kinds of things are, are meats that get, you know, basically buried in a barrel of salt and cured, and then they pull them out, and they can just set them on a shelf, and they can sit there for months without going bad. It's a preservative. And salt is kind of used this way in the Old Testament, too. In Leviticus 2, 13, um, it says, Season all your grain offerings with salt, do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offerings and add salt to all of your offerings. Why would you add salt to your offerings? And then later there's three instances where God reminds the people, my covenant with you, my covenant with David is a covenant of salt. It's like, what? What's that supposed to mean? It's another way of saying it's an everlasting covenant. Okay, it's an everlasting covenant. It's not going to go bad. Okay, it's a preserved covenant, a covenant of salt. And interestingly enough, the next place Jesus is going to go in Matthew 5 is to talk about that covenant, right? The law, the Torah, the terms of the covenant, the agreement. So when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, assuming by salt he means that you, we, are meant to be a kind of preservative in the world, what's that say about the world? What's that say about the world? Our world is in a constant state of decay. Okay, that's what he's implying, right? And you can see this. This is measured in science, the law of entropy, right? Second law of thermodynamics. Everything is in a process of moving from order into disorder. Okay, you take a slab of meat, throw it on your kitchen counter. If you leave that thing alone for a few days, right? Enough said. It's going to develop a smell. It's going to go bad, right? Um, Individually, all of us are growing older. We're in a state of starting to dematerialize, decay. You know, we are going to die eventually. Okay? And also relationally, 
You've heard it said, you know, I don't care who you are, if, if you're married and you don't work at your marriage, if you don't inject salt into your marriage, that relationship is not just going to stay peachy all by itself. Okay, it's not. It's going to decline. And that would be the same for communities and societies, policies, governments, you know, all of it. Eventually, every civilization in the world has had a rise, a pinnacle, kind of a plateau, and then a decline. Okay, everything that emerges rises and falls. That's the state of our world. And that's actually kind of the biblical view of the cosmos as well. Uh, the picture is that in Genesis 1, God created the earth and he took what was formless and chaotic and dark and void. And he, what did he do? He took the waters and he pushed them apart. And the, the ancient view of the world is that you had like the, the world is, is on top of these waters and there's a firmament where the waters above are being held from collapsing back down. And it's by God's sheer will and power and grace alone that things don't just collapse right back into chaos and death. And if you read the flood story, you know, the great flood, Noah and the great flood, the, the language that is used describes creation kind of going into reverse. And so the waters above and below collapse back in on top of each other and everything gets wiped clean so that God can restore and redeem and replant the earth. Okay, so, so God's judgment, God's judgment is always spoken of not just as I'm going to dole out punishment, but it's always a way of giving the creation over, giving people over to the, the chaotic and deconstructive, decaying result that their choices or path are heading towards anyway. Okay, does that make sense? So, so the flood is giving the creation over to where the violence and evil of the people are taking it in the first place. Chaos and destruction, right? Uh, Romans 1, Paul repeatedly says God gave them over to a debased way of thinking, right? There is a way of walking in accord with God that sustains and maintains order and life in the world. And there's a way of deciding to live our lives and the way of conducting relationships in the world that results in entropy. Okay, of collapsing back into chaos and darkness. Okay, that's kind of the biblical picture of how the world works, that the only reason that we are not in utter chaos and darkness and turmoil and death right now is because God is sustaining things. He's holding things back at bay always. Okay, so what is the statement Jesus is making here then? Just a quote from John Stott says, The notion is not that the world is tasteless and that Christians can make it less insipid, but that it is putrefying. It cannot stop itself from going bad. Only salt introduced from the outside can do this. Also, our world is in darkness. The most natural tendency in the world for every civilization is to deteriorate and decay into darkness. So for interest's sake, I decided to Google um, societal decay this week. That was a depressing thing to do. I wouldn't recommend it unless you're like in a position of some fortitude, okay? Because, you know, I, there's several ways to think about this. One, one group of articles talks about how the industrial age that we live in, by industrial I mean like we're used to things like being able to flip on the lights, turn on the oven, crank up the heat. Uh, live with electricity, live with petroleum-based fuels and all that stuff. He said, this is such an unusual thing in history. We are used to it as though it's completely normal, but most likely it's a flash in the pan. Okay. And, and when those resources run out or whenever, however long that is, and people argue left and right across the board about, you know, how to use those and how, when it's going to run out, when that's going to happen, but most likely there's going to be a serious collapse. Okay, because we're living very abnormally today, right? This is not a normal way to live, and yet we think it is. And so when that normal gets stripped away, there's going to be some kind of collapse. I read um, more about societal collapse. The other side of it is when you see signs like the disintegration of families, the family structure that sort of is the buildup of the outworking that builds into society, you start to see societal collapse at a political level, at a cultural level. 
One commentary said, societal collapse, actually I think this is Wikipedia, um, also known as civilizational collapse, is the fall of a complex human society characterized by the loss of cultural identity. Who are we? And of socioeconomic complexity, the downfall of government, and the rise of violence. Possible causes of a societal collapse include natural catastrophe, war, pestilence, famine, and depopulation. A collapsed society may revert to a more primitive state, be absorbed into a stronger society, or completely disappear. And now the scary thing is, is that we actually live in a global society, right? So unlike the Roman Empire rising to its prime and then falling after five or 600 years, it will affect the entire world because we're in a global society. And you know, I'll just tell you, personally, I, when, when I've struggled with faith, at times it's because I can look out at the world and I, and I say to myself, you know, if I were to ask myself, does the world operate in a way that looks like there is a God? Like if, if God is real, would he, would things function this way? Would they have come about the way they have? Would they be happening? Would things be happening the way they are? And that's a real challenge until I sort of challenge the challenge a little bit and realize that actually what I'm seeing in the world is the most natural thing in the world for the world to do according to scripture. You know, there's no claim in the Bible that says that if there's a God, we're not going to see these things happen. Uh, these things will happen. And that is the claim of scripture. So naturally the question is, are we seeing all this today? When each community is itself and is true to itself, the world decays like rotten fish or meat, while the church can hinder its decay. John Stott said that. So our mantra today, be true to yourself. Follow your heart. Proverbs says the heart is the most deceitful of all things. And when everyone says, I'm going to be true to myself, things start to fall apart. Not that there's, there's some good in that too, right? There's some good in, in not just conforming to the expectations of others or whatever. But at the same time, if it's a me first, when do I get mine? Whatever. Uh, when things do collapse, it becomes a poor me. You know, what happened to mine? Give me mine. Instead of rejoice in that day and be glad. Whoa. How do you get there? So Jesus says, you are the preservative. You are the thing that's supposed to be injected into a decaying, crumbling world that holds that decay and destruction at death. At, 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 uh, at mine's not working at the moment. At, uh, <laughs> keep it from happening, right? We are, if you're the church, that's, that's us. That's our job. Uh, I watched... Um, a documentary Tyler recommended. It was on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. Anybody seen this? Social Dilemma. Uh, very eye-opening because what it described among a whole bunch of other things is the effects of social media, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, um, and what it's doing primarily to younger people who don't know life without it, um, how it's affecting their image and self-esteem and all that. But the big one today was how it is, is moving us towards increasing polarization, especially in, in politics, the left and the right. And uh, these are people who are talking about this, by the way, it's like the former CEO of Pinterest. It's, it's former people from uh, Google and Instagram, and they're, and they're giving their testimonies on why they left those companies. Because the way it works is uh, these companies are going to keep you watching for as long as they possibly can, okay? You are actually the product being sold. That's why it's free. They're selling you to advertisers. So they have these incredibly intelligent computer programs that know exactly what you like to watch based on what you've clicked on in the past and what you tend to do on the internet. And so everything that you tend to see on your Facebook feed or YouTube feed is curated according to your preferences based on what you've seen. And it's so precise that people have gone down incredible conspiracy theories backed by hundreds of videos with tons of evidence, and they've had to 
um, arrests people for running into pizza parlors with guns who are claiming that they're there to release the sex slaves from the basement when the pizza parlor had no basement. Um, you know, there's, there's incredible things that are happening because on both sides, you're only seeing what they think you want to see. Okay, the content is being streamed to you based on your preferences. And so I've heard in the last three weeks from multiple people asking me, Mike, why isn't the church speaking out against Donald Trump? Against the, and they'll list off the litany, the, the white supremacy, the racism, the, you know, the sexism, all the things that one side is saying. And then I've had people from the other side saying, Mike, when is the church going to take a stand? When is the church going to speak out against what's happening with the radical left and what's happening and, what, and what's going to happen in this election and so on? And my response is trying to be, well, first of all, just for your information, Mike is not ACC. Okay. Uh, we, we are the church. We are ACC, but we are not a pastor-led church. We are an elder-led church. And the policy of those elders has always been that we will speak to specific issues that are very clear in the Bible. But when it comes to who you should or shouldn't vote for or what you should or shouldn't vote for, that is not something that we're going to speak into. You know, if we're going to critique one side, we're going to try to critique both sides. Both sides need to be critiqued. Um, you know, so we do the best we can with that. It may not always be perfect, but um, that's... For you to be an adult and, and research and figure out what you're going to do with according to a biblical worldview. Okay, that's my encouragement and my challenge to you. But what I'll try to tell people is, have you talked to anyone from the other side? Have you had a conversation? Like, nobody does this anymore. Nobody knows how to do this. This is what's being lost today in our culture is the ability to actually dialogue with people that we disagree with and ask, why do you feel the way they feel? Oh, maybe they're not racist. Oh, maybe they're not socialists. Oh, you know, and, and actually start to understand one another better. Because what I can guarantee is that all the things you're seeing, they're not seeing that. They don't have the information you have, and you don't have the information they have, because that's not the way the media works, okay? So that has led to increasing societal decline because we are seeing now in the last five years more polarization and divide and hatred and anger than we have ever seen before as a country. So the question is, now this is getting very real. The next two months, especially starting right now, are extremely uh, critical. Will you be part of the decay? Or will you be part of our society's preservation? Will you be salt and light? Or will you contribute to the problem? I grew up in a place, uh, I, was, I grew up in a, a cove on the water in Alaska, right next to a stream, a creek that had a salmon hatchery. And it was a really fun place to live. It was awesome. We'd spent a lot of time in the water. And, uh, but, you know, every summer the salmon run in their cycle, starting with the king salmon and the cohos and, and the humpies sort of enter in at some point. And, the, and the, those are the pink salmon. And, and the pink salmon they come in and they're so numerous. I don't think they are anymore, but when I was growing up, they were that like, they were like the junk fish. Nobody wanted them. Like you could practically walk across them when they're swimming up the creek to spawn. Okay. And they all just, and, and we would have fun with these things. I'm not going to admit to you some of the inhumane things we did to, to fish. <laughs> like, and, uh, you would probably, you know, um, send PETA after me or something, but, uh, we would do all kinds of things. We, the tide would come in and we'd like jump off the bridge and dive bomb the fish. You know, there'd be just masses of fish and we'd just target them and dive into them. We'd come them reeking like fish. Um, and the tide would go out though in, in like, and so September, October, those were special months in Southeast Alaska. Those were special months because this is when all the fish start to die. 
Okay, this is when all the fish start to die. So, so you, you would, you would, the tide would come in and everything's fine. The tide goes out and there's like this carpet of, of molding, maggoty, decaying fish everywhere. And, and that place would just smell so ungodly. Like it, it was so bad. And, and it was like the smell of home though, you know? So it was this horrible smell of decaying fish every time the tide went out. And this was like characteristic for about a month period of time. But the, you know, the interesting thing about it is like in a weird way, you start to like the smell. And, and it's not like you actually enjoy it. It's not like you think it smells good. It's that there's something almost nostalgic about it. Like it's like, oh yeah, this is Alaska. This is home. This is what it smells like. It's good to be here, you know? Um, and, and I think that sometimes today, we become blind to the decay around us that's actually happening and we can ignore it because we start to like the smell. I mean, that's how they get ratings, right? We consume the drama. It entertains us even though we think it's pretty sick. There's something that's satisfying about it even though we know it smells bad. And I think that we need to wake up to this a little bit. I just want to read you this quote from John Stott. It says, God intends us to penetrate the world. Christian salt has no business to remain snugly in elegant little ecclesiastical salt cellars. Our place is to be rubbed into the secular community as salt is rubbed into meat to stop it going bad. And when society does go bad, we Christians tend to throw up our hands in pious horror and reproach the non-Christian world. But should we not rather reproach ourselves? One can hardly blame unsalted meat for going bad. It cannot do anything else. The real question to ask is, where's the salt? My dad started making ceviche with like lingcod or halibut. And you cut it up into tiny little pieces. And the freaky thing about eating it is you, you know it's like this is not cooked. And it's been sitting but the reality is it sits in salt and lemon or lime juice and, um, you know, other things. And so it actually kind of cooks it with the acids and whatnot, and it's preserved. And so when you eat it, it's delicious. Jesus is telling a group of underclass agrarian farmers and fishermen that they are the salt that can stop the decay. They are the light that forms a counter city a city on a hill, a beacon, which shines in the darkness of our world. How do we typically try to stop the decay? How do we try to stop it? What did they expect Jesus to do, to be? When are you going to declare yourself as a king, Jesus? When are you going to overthrow the authorities? When are you going to overpower and kick out the Romans you know, the, the tempter says, just bow down to me and I'll give all the kingdoms to you, Jesus. That's the way we would try to deal with the problem. Let's get rid of one ruler by replacing it with another. Let's provide human solutions to human problems. But, you know, you might be able to prolong something for a little while that way. But it's all one decaying system after another. That's how we trip, typically try to stop it, overthrow the power that's there. So how do we be salt and light? Well, we read it last week. We are salt and light when our character reflects that which is depicted in the Beatitudes. It is essentially to be Christ-like. Okay? Having a hunger and thirst for righteousness, recognizing that we ourselves are spiritually depraved, mourning our own individual and corporate brokenness, meekness, humility, humbleness. We receive as a gift through faith the blessings of God's kingdom, and that changes us, that transforms us. We respond to the world's hostility with radical mercy, not with more hostility. Because we've been shown mercy. Our character, excuse me, this doesn't mean watering down truth or not taking a stand on the issues. It just means that our character and our conduct towards one another is that of mercy. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God, it says. When the world's pattern is to twist the truth and the slander and, and slander to make themselves sound really pious, whether on Facebook or in the public realm, um, by showing how much better they are than the other side. Right? When that's the way the world does it, Christians are called to take a different approach. Our purity comes from a heart transformation, not what's external, but what's in the heart, right? We look at the heart. Tim Keller said, it's easy to mistake a morally restrained heart for a spiritually changed heart. It's easy to mistake a morally restrained heart for a spiritually changed heart. Heart. There's a transformation that results in a heart change. It's not just moral effort, right? Our desires change fundamentally when we come to know Jesus personally. We no longer need to prove our own goodness through external displays of our own piety. And finally, in a world of ever-increasing hostility, Christians are to be known as peacemakers. Okay? Because Christ reconciled us to God by his own blood, making us heirs, sons, inheritors, children of his kingdom, of his household. Okay, he did that for us. And so we display that when we can bring people into that relationship with God and with one another. So we seek to be agents of reconciliation, peacemakers. But at the bottom line, if we do not remain salty, if we do not keep our light from shining, then there is no impact. And if you do, if you do exhibit salt and light, you very well may get hurt. But make sure, as Jesus says, blessed are you when you are persecuted, when people insult you because of me, he says. So make sure it's not because of me. <laughs> you know the difference? Like, he doesn't say because of your attitude or because you are beating people over the head with a Bible or being a jerk, right? He's, it's like, you know, Peter talks about being persecuted for the wrong reasons, like we're just making people weary with our words or something like that. You know, there's, uh, there's a wrong way to try to be salt and light. Um, there is a right way. If it's legitimately because of Jesus that people reject you, we can rejoice in this. How? Why? Well, there's two possible responses to being salt and light. See, salt cleanses, it disinfects, and it preserves, but it also stings. It also stings. And light illuminates, it shows beauty, and it gives wisdom and direction and meaning, but it also exposes. It also reveals. Ephesians 5, 8 through 13 says, For you were once darkness, but now are light in the world. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what, is please, what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. If you are salt and light in a dark and decaying world, they will either, bookends of the passage that we read today, see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven, or they will insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of Jesus. So how should we respond to that? Should we say, oh, poor me. No, he says, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. So how do you get the kind of resilience that gives you the ability to be salt and light, knowing that you might get hurt, you might get insulted, you might be rejected? How will you not become bland and flavorless, 
or hide your light under a bowl. Look to Jesus, who, as Hebrews says, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So you got to be blessed. You have to have received a blessing that makes the life of living in his kingdom of blessing better than the life we would try to save by hiding our light or not being salty. Okay? You got to know how blessed you are. That's what the Beatitudes are all about. The poor in spirit, those who mourn the meek, those who hunger for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, those who are persecuted. Jesus took all of that. He took our relational, societal, physical decay in order to preserve, to save us. He died in the dark so we could receive his light. And so when I look at Jesus and I see what he went through and was willing to do for me, to preserve me, to save me, maybe if I dig in and let that truth really sink in, I realize I can do the same thing. Without self-pity. And when I see Jesus pouring himself out for his enemies, maybe then I can do that too. The next couple months, this is not theoretical. Like this is crucial right now. This is like, I don't know. I don't know what your action step is. Maybe you have a way of having self-control on social media and, and you can handle how to, how to do this in a digital world. For most people, I'd say, man, turn that thing off. Like, I mean, I just don't know how, <laughs> how, to, how to do it. I don't know what your action step is, but this is a time right now that the church is desperately needed to be salt and light in a quickly decaying society. When this election happens, no matter which way it goes, probably, I could be wrong, but probably all hell is going to break loose. Okay, they're either going to be counting votes for months or people are going to be super depressed, super angry. You know, I, I don't know. Either way, it's going to be insane. Are you ready for that? Do you personally have a support network of people in your life that can help you with that? And are you ready? And do you know what it means to be salt and light in the midst of that destructiveness? Because that's what we need. Not just you're wrong and we're right, but we got to recover something that's been lost. A counterculture for the common good. Society's preservation, salvation. Be the city on the hill that God is calling us to be. Let's pray. Father, as we come to your table now, I'm reminded of Paul in a, in a 14 day storm in the middle of the night in a ship that was about to be wrecked, getting all the people together and breaking bread and distributing it and giving thanks and saying, take this and eat it. It's for your preservation. Preservation. You gave and poured yourself out for our preservation. You showed us what it really looks like to be merciful, to be a peacemaker, to be a comforter, you, God, gave that to us freely as a gift to be received by faith so that we can sprinkle it, rub it, shake it around, shine it. And that's what our world needs because the most natural thing in the world left to its own devices is to crumble and decay. It's not enough to just put hope in another political system to come and fix all the problems. There's deeper wounds, there's deeper damage, and there's deeper rot. 
It's time for the church to be the church. And Lord, we might differ in opinions on what exactly that should look like, but I pray we would really dive into these texts right here, Matthew 5, and look at Jesus and what you've done that put a permanent eternal end to our spiritual destruction. Maybe we can take a cue from that. God, if there's anyone here who just feels like my life is crumbling, my life is in, in decay right now, I just pray that they would find comfort and peace and reassurance from you because you are the God of all comfort and you give this promise of restoration and healing and eternal life through your kingdom. We are sons, not in relation necessarily to our gender. We are sons in the sense that we are inheritors, recipients of everything that you have made. Your kingdom belongs to your children. And so I just pray you would reassure us with that and fill us with your love. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.